Welcome to From Betrayal to Breakthrough, and here is a mini dose of Dr. Debbie where I'm sharing tips, suggestions, strategies, and sometimes just motivation to have you move past your betrayal once and for all. Hi, Dr. Debbie here, and today I'm talking about which type are you? I did a little experiment the other day, and I sent an email out to everyone on our newsletter list, and you may have even received it, and I said, you know, if I can help you, respond to this email and let me know. I just want to help you in any way I can. Well, it was so interesting because out of all of the people who responded, they kind of got broken up into different sections and different groups. And I want you to see which group you wound up in. There was First, there was the, I call them the thrivers. And these were the people who just responded saying, Dr. Debbie, I'm doing this and I'm doing that. And this was the worst thing that ever, ever happened to me. Of course, they're telling me about their betrayal. It was the absolute worst thing that ever happened to me. But you know something? I started doing this thing and then that led to the next thing and that led to the next thing. And I'm feeling so much better. I know I still have a way to go, but I am moving forward and I'm doing it. And it's it's really, it's helping and it's working. And I've been listening to your podcast and I've been reading your books or whatever. And it is really helping and I'm on my way. So with those people, I responded, you know, go you, that's great. And I I really kind of was specific about things that I noticed about what they said. Like, wow, when you said you're doing this, that's amazing. I, because a lot of people wouldn't be willing to do that or whatever. And I responded to them and I was so excited to hear the changes they were making based on just their willingness. Like they were just unwilling to sit in it any longer. They wanted to find a way through it. And that's exactly what they were doing. And you know, I always talk about the study and there were actually three groups who did not heal. And one group, I well, I remember saying to myself, well, you know, the people who were the hardest hit would grow the least because they had the most to overcome. And that made total sense to me. I was dead wrong. That had nothing to do with it at all. It was the people who put their heads down saying, I'm not picking it up till I'm out the other side. They blew the doors off of the ones who were numbing or medicating or suppressing or any of those other things. And listen, I get it. We're in so much pain and we need to get through our day. So we think, okay, let me take something. Let me start uh, emotionally eating or drinking or numbing in some way. It may make the day a bit easier to get through, not without a price. And it is so common to run to the doctor who can put you on a mood stabilizer or an anti-anxiety medication or something like that, or to have that glass of wine or two or three, or start emotionally eating. We do all these things because there's so much pain and we just figure, well, how can I how can I manage, you know, if you have children, deal with my kids. And if you work, deal with my work. And if you have aging parents, deal with my aging parents, whatever it is, and, and function and get through this. So we figure, well, let me just numb and that'll be my way of coping. It's really just delaying because until and unless you intentionally and deliberately move through the betrayal, it is there and it will not heal until you do the work to heal it. Anyway, so for those thrivers, it was such a thrill to see all the different ways they were um, they were moving forward and the health issues that were clearing up, what they were seeing and feeling and experiencing now that they have moved through, you know, out of the stage two, which is, that's just deep trauma and and the rug has been pulled out of you, out from under you. And then even stage three, the most common place we get stuck and moving into that place of stage four where transformation begins and stage five and beyond. The next were the sharers. So that was, that was the first group and it was so exciting to respond to them. The next group was, this was, these were the sharers and they would tell me their story. And, uh, and it was, I mean, some of these stories, we hear stories like this every single day. And I think for some of them, it just felt so good to know that this was a safe space to share their story. Uh, they knew it was not going to be met with any judgment, any anything. I just want to help if I could. So uh, for the sharers, what I did was I responded with, you know, acknowledging their story and where they're at and giving them an idea or two that may be a different way to think because what they know has gotten them to where they are, right? So it's going to take 
something different to bring them to a different place. So sometimes just cracking open that door of possibility to something, doing something differently, thinking in a different way, get someone to consider something, doing something, you know, differently. And then of course, having a different result. So for them, I responded and, uh, and I hope they, they took one of those, one of those tips or ideas or suggestions that I gave them because, you know, when you're in it, it's so hard to see. And of course, listen, this is all I do all day long between me and our certified PBT coaches within, um, PBT. This is, this is all we do. So if, for me seeing something, and I know where someone's at and also I've been coaching for 32 years. So I see where someone's at and I see where they're stuck and it's, it's like, okay, well, what about this? And it may seem like such a small insignificant thing that I'm suggesting that they do, but it's sometimes it's in those small, seemingly insignificant things that someone tries something, has that measure of success, that feeling of success, which motivates them to do more and more and more. So even though, you know, when I look at anybody, anybody's story, and I try to help them in any way, I am always looking at it from a place of the five stages from betrayal to breakthrough. And I don't care if I move someone one degree, five degrees, 10 degrees, by the end of our conversation, they're going to be moving in that direction towards the next stage. Because listen, let's face it, here's the truth. We only move in one of two ways, further or closer to everything we want. So if you do no more than say to yourself when you're about to do something, when you're thinking something, right? Is this thought, is this action, is this decision moving me further or closer to everything I want? What would, what would that do? just if you implemented that. So anyway, that second group, the, the sharers, I just loved responding to them and giving them even just one thing they can do and hoping that that one thing really just moves the needle for them and having them move closer to that next stage. So that was the shares. Well, this was, this was an, an, another interesting group. And these were the resigners. What do I, what do I mean by that? This was the group that told me their story and then somewhere in that said, but there's nothing I can do about it. This is just the way it is. I can't get out of this. This is as good as it's going to be. I need to find a way to live with it. They're resigned. And it's so sad because once we've been betrayed, of course we can be resigned because it seems so big. How can I ever move through this? How can I make a change based on where I'm at right now? I feel like I can't even get out of bed. How in the world could I actually heal, right? It seems so far and so big. But instead of looking at it saying, I don't quite know yet, but there are the five stages from betrayal to breakthrough and I will move inch by inch by inch closer to that next stage. You're not going to get through stage five the first day, but at least you're moving in the right direction. But when you resign yourself and you say, there's just absolutely no way I can heal and there's nothing that's going to change and there's nothing I can do with this. Well, you are, it's, it's essentially you're saying, I am deciding to stay stuck in stage three, which is quicksand, by the way. And that's just the way it's going to be. Now, here's what happens in stage three. If you're not familiar with the stages, I talk about them all the time. But stage three, here's the one where when we're here, now think about what happens. We're here for a while. We're not supposed to be, but we don't know that. And then what happens is we start thinking and overthinking, and then we infuse some emotion and some feeling into it. And now we create all these beliefs and the mind believes everything you say. So if you believe I'm not lovable, I'm not worthy, I'm not deserving, it must be my fault, I'm not good enough, I'm not pretty enough, I'm not thin enough, I'm not rich enough, I'm not whatever. So then your mind's like, wow, I didn't know you felt that way. Okay, my job is to go along with everything you say. And then what happens is, since this is the way you feel, well, this is the energy you're putting out. Well, like energy attracts like energy. So now you're attracting people and circumstances and even relationships towards you to confirm, yep, this is where you belong. Here's typically where we'll join some support group and we will actually sabotage our healing because now we found our people 
right? Because if complaining about it is what you have in common with them, well, what happens when you stop complaining? So we sabotage ourselves. Or here's where you may start growing, but you're gonna sabotage your growth because let's say your betrayer isn't changing and you're afraid of outgrowing your betrayer. Now, other people may be hearing this right now and say, well, that's crazy. If they're unwilling to, tr to change, well, of course I should outgrow them but I want all of you. And I invite all of you to really think about that because I see it all the time. We stay in the pain of the known familiar because we don't know. We don't know what to expect when we heal. So we, we rationalize this somehow thinking, okay, well, it really wasn't that bad. Well, you know, they said they'd stop. Well, you know, maybe I could just get used to it or try to just look the other way. And I mean, we, I hear this all the time. And I can also tell you, there was another, another group who did not heal. This was the group where the betrayer had very little consequences. So whether it was out of financial fear, uh, not wanting to break up the family, uh, it was ch uh, fear of change, religious reasons, that was a big one. They did everything just to try to put it behind them without the betrayer having really uh, any consequences. And I saw two things with this group. Number one, a further deterioration of the relationship. And number two, this group was the most physically sick with symptoms of post-betrayal syndrome. So be very careful of this. Now, as if that wasn't bad enough for the resigners, here's what you can expect. When you are so unhappy because nothing has really changed, you're just resigning yourself that this is as good as it's going to get for you. Now think about it. You're, you're marinating in this and you're, so now the only thing that can happen is you further suppress your immune system. Your adrenals are struggling. Now you may have hormonal issues, weight changes, uh, oh, you name it, digestive issues, sleep issues. So physically you're not feeling well. And the only thing you can expect is more of that. And then also now you're medicating and suppressing the symptoms and not really doing much to change. And uh, in addition to that, think about this, because you're so unhappy, but you still have to go through your day, you have to raise your kids, you have to go to work, whatever it is you have to do. Right here in this stage three, here's where we start numbing, avoiding, and distracting. So now you start take, you know, using food, drugs, alcohol, work, TV, whatever it is, to numb and avoid and distract yourself from this painful place. So think about it. You do that for a day, a week, a month. Now it's a habit, a year, 10 years, 20 years. And I can see someone 20 years later and say, that emotional eating you're doing, that numbing in front of the TV, whatever. Do you think that has anything to do with your betrayal? And they would look at me like I'm crazy. And they would say, it happened 20 years ago. All they did was put themselves in stage three and stay there. Do you see that? Do you see how this happens? Stage three is quicksand. It's a trap. You do not want to stay there. I want to make sure you know what happens when you're in stage three. So the resigners, those are the ones. They've resigned themselves. This is as good as it's going to get. So they're choosing stage three and all that goes with it. So, so far we covered the thrivers. These are the ones who are moving through the five stages of from betrayal to breakthrough. They're, they're just trying new things to heal physically, mentally, emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, and maybe they're creating their own kind of recipe there, but either way, they're moving through the stages. The next, the sharers. They expressed what was going on with them, looking for a, a tip, a tool, a strategy, a solution, and I gave it to them. They're willing to do the work. They're very unhappy with where they're at, but they're willing, and willingness is huge. Willingness is huge when you're ready to heal. That will take you so much further than, than almost anything else. Willingness has so much more to do with time. It can, it, people say, oh, does it take a long time? Willingness has way more to do with it than how much time it takes. The next, the resigned. That's the group. Nope, that's as good as it's gonna get. I just have to find a way to live with it. Well, if you're finding a way to live with that, live with all the physical, mental, emotional, psychological uh, symptoms that go along with that too, because that's what happens in stage three. And um, it's a trap. It really is. So I hope you, you'll you reconsider uh, that, that resigned feeling. There was a fourth group too. This was the group. These were the skeptics. And this I found so interesting. And I understand where it came from. And people responded with things like, I don't trust you. And uh, why should I tell you? 
And why do you want to know my story? And why do you care now? And there were a lot of other, other things I won't even share that were just downright mean. Now I get it. For those people, hurt people hurt people. So I didn't even respond to those. But the other ones, think about it. Trust was shattered. And that's what happens with betrayal. Trust is shattered. This was the person you trusted the most who proved untrustworthy. So then the next part of that is, where was I? How did I not see? How did I not know? So if I can't trust the person I trust the most, and, and I don't even trust myself, well, how in the world can I trust in anything and anyone? So then here I come out with this email, hey, let me help you. So I understand. Why should I trust you? That's where that lack of trust is coming from. But I want you to really look at this because think about it. Now, I'm not saying my coaching is the be all end all, but what if I could have given them a really helpful tip or tool or strategy or idea that would have helped them? Can you see how that shattering of trust and the unwillingness to be even receptive to my help, can you see how it's preventing them from healing. Now take that in other areas of their life because how we are in, you know, in one area is kind of how we are in every area. So in what other ways are they holding a connection, intimacy at a distance or support or help, right? How else is someone like that keeping these things at a distance? And, or, or even how by putting the big wall up, you know, sure, you keep out the bad ones, but you're keeping out the good ones too. So where, if this is you, the skeptic, I'm speaking to you, where else is your skepticism from the shattering of trust? So I get where it showed up. I get why it's there. Where else are you not trusting? And how is it affecting you? Is it in a friend who wants to help you and you don't trust them? Is it in um, maybe a business partnership or opportunity, and you don't trust it. Now, I'm not saying that everything out there is legitimate and good. No. And here's the thing too, until and unless you heal the betrayal, these opportunities in the form of people and situations will come around to have you work on what's needed to heal. I am not suggesting the betrayal is your fault, but there is a profound lesson needing to be learned. And until and unless you learn that lesson, you will have opportunities in the form of repeat betrayals. Uh, so if these opportunities keep showing up for you, know that that is a classic sign of an unhealed betrayal. But, but really think about if you're one of those skeptics and where your first instinct is to just, you know, say, what do you, why do you care? Why do you want to know? I don't trust you. More than that, Let's just say, like, let's just say I was going to give them the most, most earth shattering <laughs> suggestion or solution that would have changed their life. Like, let's just use that. Imagine that. Now imagine they didn't trust. They never rebuilt that trust. They never learned to trust again. And they didn't take that advice or strategy that really could have helped them. Can you see the power you're giving and you're continuing to give that person who hurt you. So think about this. It's not even necessarily the most recent betrayal because let's say you have a series of repeat betrayals because your original betrayal was never healed. So let's imagine your parent when you were a little kid did something awful or a girlfriend or boyfriend who broke your heart in high school, right? Did something so painful and you were struggling and that was never healed. Now you have uh, experience, you have a lifetime of experiences in betrayal. And then other opportunities come along, like I want to help or something like that. And, and it's, it's met with the big wall up, no nope, anger, you know, distance, all of that. Look at the power you're giving and continuing to give that person who hurt you, right? It could be 10, 20, 30 plus years. And do you see how left unhealed that is continuing to impact you and affect you today? It's impacting you in your health, right? With symptoms of post-betrayal syndrome because time won't heal it. 
right? A new relationship won't heal it. Healing will heal it. So now here you are walking around with symptoms showing up because of something unhealed from possibly decades ago. Look at the missed opportunities. Look at the physical symptoms. Look at the mental and emotional symptoms, anxiety, depression, hypervigilance, all of this because of what someone did all that time ago. Here's what I'm just going to really put the, what's that saying? Put the salt in the wound because I want you to get this. That person may not know, care, remember. They may not even be alive. And here you are, years if not decades later, with those symptoms, withholding love, withholding forgiveness, not learning to trust again, whatever it is for you because of what someone did all those years ago. Do you see how unfairly you're treating yourself? I, I, I just really want to make sure to drive this point home because for those skeptics, I mean, my heart goes out to them because I know they're in a prison and they've, they've enclosed themselves in a prison. They have locked the door and they are not letting themselves out. And the way out is through learning to trust again, learning to feel safe again, learning to love again. Do you need to heal? Oh yes, of course you do. But when you do, you do, you feel better, you live better, you're making better decisions. You are, of course you're cautious, but you're not so skeptical that you miss the most beautiful opportunities. I mean, again, maybe my support and suggestions and strategies weren't the be all end all, I'm not you know, suggesting that they are. I just wanna use them as such a concrete example. I know what I was sharing to the, you know, for the thrivers and the sharers, you know, the ones who wanted the information, but I was withholding it from the skeptics because, well, the resigners, they weren't receptive and the skeptics weren't even willing to engage in the conversation. They weren't even willing to share. So where is your lack of trust showing up for you? Where is it impacting you? How is it impacting you? How is it holding you back? And I invite you to ask yourself the question, what would trusting again, what would healing give me? What would it allow me to do? Who would it allow me to become? Life is waiting, my friends, and it's waiting for you when you move through the stages and when you use your trauma for your transformation, when you use your pain to do something good. I didn't do anything you couldn't do. I just, there wasn't a roadmap. It, it showed up in the study that I did, but there wasn't a roadmap. But I was like, this stinks. I could either be the recipient of betrayal and like the poster child for it, and yeah, I have a powerful story and I'll get a whole lot of sympathy. Or what if I could do something really good with this? What if I could do something really good with something really painful? And for you, what's waiting for you when you heal? Is it a new level of health? Is it a new business? Is it a new passion project? Is it a new relationship either with the person who hurt you on such a different level? or with someone entirely new, remember, you. if you're in stage three, you can only attract stage three. If you're in stage four, you will attract a stage four person. If you're in stage five, well, that's how you who you attract. So I would so much rather you spend the time and the effort on your healing so that you attract and become someone worthy and deserving of this beautiful new version of you who's being created because that's the opportunity. You don't want to miss an opportunity when it comes to trauma. The trauma hits you so hard, but when you do something really good with something really painful, that's trauma well served. So again, there are the thrivers. Go you. If you're just, you're just doing the work, there are the sharers. These are the ones who share their story, who are willing to get some support and ideas and tools to move them forward. There are the resigned. These are the ones who just, they are convinced that this is as good as it's going to get and they better get used to it. And then there are the skeptics. And for you, I really recommend taking a look and seeing how it's impacting you. You deserve so much better than that. Don't let that unhealed betrayal, that chattering of trust from either recently or all those years ago to prevent you from the love, from the connection, 
from the intimacy, from the support that you deserve. I hope this helps and I'll see you next time. You need the right tools, support, and the right community to move through the five stages from betrayal to breakthrough. And we have all that within the PBT Institute. So join us at the PBT, as in post-betrayal transformation, thepbtinstitute.com. There's a version of you who's so confident, healthy, peaceful, and happy on the other end of your healing. And we can't wait to help you get there. We got you. Thanks for listening. And here's to your breakthrough.